Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 51, Peoples of the Steppe, Scythians in Saka to Parthians in Uechi. Throughout our journey in this podcast, we've covered quite the range of peoples and civilizations, varying from Greece to Carthage and India to Rome. However, to some extent, all of the peoples that we have covered share the same basic elements, sedentary, agricultural, and with some degree of urbanization. The same is generally true for Egypt, China, and the Near East. And when we often talk about great powers, when we track the progression of humanity, these are the places that immediately come to mind for the vast majority of the time. One key element that is often neglected or largely forgotten in the discussion of Eurasian history also happens to be a topic that is of a particular source of dread for many of the peoples who lived in these settled societies. For the Roman Empire and its heirs, the Huns and Avars were scourges of God and the sign of the end times. The Chinese emperors of the Qin and Han dynasties paid dearly in blood, silk, and treasure to keep the Xiongnu at bay. And the systematic destruction of Baghdad in 1258 was the bloody climax of a series of Western and Central Asian campaigns enacted by the family of Genghis Khan. These peoples, whether they were Huns, Mongols, or Scythians, belonged to a group generally categorized as the Steppe Nomads, who share a similar lifestyle of nomadic pastoralism centered on the use of the horse that remained largely unchanged for thousands of years. Though we associate them with their often brutal invasions, the peoples of the steppe have played an instrumental role in dictating the course of human history through trade, exchange, and, indeed, warfare with the settled societies. The Hellenistic period was no different in this regard, and was actually a time of great change in the relationship between both parties, as political instability would result in the movement of several new tribes along the steppe into Europe and Central Asia, the Sarmatians, the Uechi, and above all else, the Parni. In this episode, we will be discussing the steppe nomads, covering a brief history of the steppe along with a generalized look at nomadic culture and society, then focus on their role within the Hellenistic world. To begin our episode, let me put a bit of disclaimer. The history of, well, prehistory is often complicated, tenuous, and is constantly being amended thanks to new discoveries, competing theories between those such as linguists and archaeologists, and sometimes depending upon political or cultural climates. As it is not my specialty, what I am presenting is the approximate and summarized versions of very extensive and detailed arguments, of which you can find in the bibliography that I have provided on my website and in the show transcript, in case you were looking for more detail on the specifics of prehistory, such as genetics, linguistics, and other things of that nature. Across Eurasia lies an enormous rolling ocean of temperate grasslands, often referred to as a belt or a corridor, stretching from the Danube River to the heartland of Mongolia, and measuring some 6,000 to 7,000 kilometers in length. Its hot and dry summers reach an excess of 45 degrees Celsius and only produce a pittance of rainfall. These are matched equally by its brutal and windy winters, frequently falling below minus 40 Celsius. This is known as the steppe, a home to humanity since at least the Paleolithic period, and to eke out an existence along these often unforgiving wastes requires hardiness, ingenuity, and a life largely on the move. The earliest origins of quote-unquote typical steppe nomad society can be traced back to the agriculturalists from central Anatolia, who migrated into Europe sometime around the 7th or 6th millennium, bringing domesticated animals like cattle in places largely occupied by foraging peoples, in our case, the Pontic Caspian Steppe. The Pontic Caspian Steppe refers to the region approximately located just north of the Black Sea, between the Danube and Volga rivers, Romania, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, and the easternmost portions of Russia. During their initial occupation, they began to develop a pastoral lifestyle, herding sheep and cattle while maintaining small-scale agriculture. Movement deeper into the steppe was gradual, but did happen. The problem is, is that much of the grasslands are made up of grains that are inedible to humans, and soil that is not particularly productive for farming, at least when you move past the Black Sea, for reasons that will be explained shortly. It is also likely that this area was home to the peoples known as the Proto-Indo-Europeans. PIE, as it is shortened to, is a hypothetical language group that is the mother tongue of a large portion of the world's languages, ranging from Germanic to Latin to Sanskrit. 
and is thought to have emerged sometime around 6000 to 5000 BC in the Pontic Caspian region. It is highly unlikely that these PIEs possessed a uniform tribal or racial identity, and it must be mentioned that language groupings are not synonymous for race or ethnicity. To truly take advantage of the steppe, humans would come to rely on another inhabitant, a stocky, four-legged, and shaggy-coated creature known as the horse. Any attempt to summarize the importance of the horse in the development of humankind is almost always going to be a bit of an understatement, and this is especially true to life on the steppe. The earliest known example of horse husbandry occurs sometime around 4800 BC in modern Ukraine, and it has proved essential to the nomads. Compared to domesticated animals like sheep or cattle, horses are able to dig into the snow and soil in order to feed on those otherwise inedible grains, making them reasonably easier to maintain and providing a way to get access to the energy stored within the grasslands. Their fur, bones, hooves, and meat could all be used for food products or building materials. An alcoholic drink known as kumish can be made from fermented mare's milk, while the rest of it was turned into curds or yogurt. In addition to their byproducts, the horse would prove to be an invaluable asset as a working animal. Horse riding likely didn't occur until the late 5th millennium at the earliest, and it must be understood that these horses were nothing like the stallions or draft horses that we have come to associate with modern horsemanship. Their closest living relatives would be the Perzevalsky horses, which look more akin to donkeys, but are very hardy and well suited for the environment of the steppe. Domestication took place some time later, perhaps in the early 4th millennium as suggested by evidence from the Botai, a community in ancient Kazakhstan which demonstrated concrete signs of horse riding by at least 3500 BC. Shepherding while on horseback allows the rider to cover up to 60 kilometers per day, and can more than double the size of their flock. For instance, with the addition of the horse, it enables a shepherd to go from 200 sheep to overseeing almost 500. Given that livestock was perhaps one of the only forms of wealth for steppe people, this resulted in the gradual development of an elite who possessed the greatest number of horses, which in turn allowed them to manage over much larger flocks compared to those without. Inevitably, the expansion of a flock size would demand greater areas for grazing, but also attract the attention of competitors. And so, the indispensable horse would also demonstrate another use, warfare. It must be understood that warfare during this early period of horse riding was not like the great armies of heavily armored cataphracts of the Parthians. Warfare was focused more on small-scale tribal raiding, but the advantages were obvious in terms of speed and mobility. Over time, though, the relationship between the two communities, nomadic and settled, would become more and more intertwined. The nomads had almost exclusive access to these horses, but wanted grain and luxury goods that were largely only available to the urbanized settlers. This pattern would be repeated throughout history, and it cannot be understated in how important the nomads were to the development of long-distance trade routes, thanks to their easy movement across the steppe. All the while, nomadic societies would continue to become more complex, namely the Yamnaya and Srubnaya cultures along the Pontic Caspian steppe during the 3rd and 2nd millennia. There was also the Andronovo and Sintashta of the Central Asian steppe in the 2nd millennium. These groupings are the result of modern labels based upon shared material identity rather than any official tribal designation. However, the population capacity of the steppe was becoming strained, and the wealthy agricultural civilizations of the Bronze Age became increasingly attractive, whether as potential employers or, more dramatically, an area to settle in in the face of political turbulence and climatic instability. The migration of the Indo-Europeans out of the Pontic Caspian steppe occurred across many centuries, in multiple waves, and in multiple directions. Some migrated into Central Europe and the Greek Peninsula, becoming the ancestors of Celtic, Italic, and Hellenic speakers, while others would move into the Iranian Plateau and in India, forming the group known as the Indo-Iranians, the forerunners of Persian and Sanskrit. These migrations were not necessarily invasions, but no doubt the implicit threat of violence could be backed up by the introduction of a later nomadic invention, the War Chariot, which soon became firmly entrenched in the militaries of the late Bronze Age powers. Several of these groups would settle by becoming integrated with the original inhabitants or ruling over them, such as the Kingdom of the Mitanni in the middle of the second millennium. The collapse of the Bronze Age civilizations and trade network in the 12th and 11th centuries was also a time of change for the steppe as we begin to see the crystallization of the societies that we typically associate as steppe nomads. 
horse riding had achieved a new level of mastery, and the invention of the compound bow would enable the predatory bands of nomadic raiders that would swarm throughout Eurasia to raid and pillage. In about the 8th century BC, the Cimmerians would ride into the Near East and wreak havoc in Asia Minor before being bested by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. At the same time, another nomadic group, the Scythians or Saka, would drive out the Cimmerians, becoming the dominant culture in the Pontic Caspian and Central Asian steppes for the next several centuries. The history of nomadic steppe peoples goes all the way back to ancient times, something I'm sure we'll hear about shortly. But interestingly enough, the last great nomadic conqueror was a man who lived in the 14th century. This man is remembered by history as Timur, Tamur, Tamerlane, or simply Timur. My name is James, and I'm the host of the Timur Podcast, a show that investigates the life, conquests, character, and legacy of Timur. If that sounds interesting to you, find out more at TimurPodcast.com, or find the show in most other places you listen to history podcasts. And with that said, take it away, Derek. Our best literary account from the Greco-Roman authors about classical nomadic life comes from Herodotus, who dedicates the near entirety of his fourth book to covering Scythia and its inhabitants during the 5th century. He claimed to have traveled into the Black Sea region while researching for his work, and many of his observations have been validated over the last few centuries thanks in large part to the archaeological excavations of the Scythians' tombs. These kurgans, as they are called, are large artificial earthen mounds that dot the landscapes of the steppe, primarily designed to inter the bodies of the nobility, and through organized research digs, and some tomb robbing, we've been able to uncover great amounts of goods and remains dating to antiquity. Generally speaking, the dominant nomadic culture from the Black Sea to Transoxiana during the 8th to the 2nd century BC is broadly classified as Scythian. This is based on similar material cultures and practices shared between the groups inhabiting the Pontic Caspian Steppe, which can be generally seen as the European Scythians and those of the Central Asian Steppe, the Asian Scythians. The Asian Scythians are also known as the Saka, a term used by Iranian-speaking people such as the Persians, who gives us names like Sakar Tigrak Hauda, the Scythians with pointed hats, who dwell between the Caspian and Aral Seas, and the Saka Homavarga, the Scythians who drink Soma, some sort of intoxicant, living along the Juxartes River, the modern Sirdaria. Nomad political life was organized around the tribe, a group bound by family or political ties which moved along the steppe with portable tents, similar to the Turkic yurt, and wagons designed to transport the family and their belongings. Up to the Hellenistic period, the most powerful and numerous political bodies of a steppe society would be in the form of a confederation, dominated by a particular tribe who possessed enough diplomatic or military clout to exert some sort of control over their neighbors. They could be led by a monarch, like King Skunka of the Saka Tikrak Hauda, or Queen Tomiris of the Masagitai, but the identity of the individual tribes within the kingdom or confederacy could continue to exist with their own rulers. How exactly a ruler was chosen depended upon the tribe, as some were hereditary monarchies like the Arsakid dynasty of Parthia, while others were elected, as was done by the 13th century Mongols at their Kurul Tai. Leaders could also bestow gifts to followers to bolster their popularity and reaffirm ties of friendship and oaths, thus ensuring their continued supremacy. It must be mentioned that members of the steppe societies existed on a gradient between pastoralism and agriculture, some acting partially or wholly as settled agriculturalists and others exclusively nomadic. For instance, Herodotus differentiates between the Scythians who tended the land as farmers and those of the royal Scythians, who were the dominant tribe of the Pontic Caspian steppe. Visually, we are able to get quite a clear picture of the dress and clothing of the nomads at the time. The headwear of the Scythians and other tribes, the conical felt cap sometimes referred to as a Phrygian hat, is almost universally seen as a sign of steppe peoples, and depicted on all varieties of art, such as Scythian metalwork, Attic pottery, and the Persian reliefs adorning Persepolis and Behistun. Clothing made of wool, felt, or leather could be beautifully decorated with beadwork and bright vivid dyes, and the home was furnished with rugs or carpets that would require a large amount of time and effort to produce. The art style we associate with the Scythians in Saka is known as animal style, and as the name implies, it emphasizes motifs using animals of the steppe, such as deer, horses, and big cats. These have a certain fluidity to their shape and design, and often reflect the religious beliefs of the nomads, 
translated into gold ornaments or tapestries, and sometimes into tattoos, which have been found preserved on the bodies of both men and women from the Kurgans. The time that was available for recreation could be spent hunting, a favorite subject of Scythian artists, or through the inhalation of smoke, generated by placing cannabis seed into a bowl full of coals within a small tent, allowing for ritual purification and, of course, a narcotic effect by essentially hotboxing the tent. Like virtually every ancient society, conflict between the steppe tribes was commonplace, and a characteristic mode of warfare was developed, centered primarily on the bow and the horse. In some tribes, Almost every male member was instructed in how to ride a horse from a very young age, giving them a hard-earned reputation as skilled horsemen, capable of riding either bareback or with a Scythian creation, the saddle. The saddle and kit of wealthier riders could be quite ornate, and it is no surprise that we have found many horses buried in the kurgans of their masters, as attested to by Herodotus. Most of these horses were close to the wild variety, the stockier breeds native to the steppe, but centuries of horse husbandry was able to produce much larger varieties, most famously the heavenly horses of the Fergana Valley. The other crucial tool was the composite bow, a nomadic invention which was wood, sinew, and animal horn glued together and left to cure for about a year. It is designed to create a crescent moon shape when unstrung, and when strung it looks like the number 3, but it grants extra tension and pull given that you are drawing it backwards. Composite bows require great strength to use, but its power output was incredible, giving an effective range of about half a kilometer, or about 400 yards, and some nomads coated their arrows in poisons to add an extra punch. While the horse archer is the icon of nomadic military prowess, their armies were not uniformly composed of cavalry, as infantry to various degrees would be involved, but they were also quite innovative when it came to heavy cavalry. The cataphracts, known in Greek as the cataphractoi, were a type of heavily armored cavalry, furnished with lamellar or scale armor nearly protecting the entirety of the rider's upper body, including their face and arms. Their horses were similarly dressed as well, and the rider was given a large lance to run through any potential combatants instead of a bow and arrows, since their role was to charge and disperse enemy formations rather than acting as a mobile force. The origins of the cataphracts are more than likely rooted in the cavalry traditions of the steppe along the Oxus River, and they were quickly adopted by the Greeks, namely the Seleucids, who encountered them while battling the Parthians, as would the Romans. One of the unique features of steppe culture was the general attitude of the nomads towards women participating in warfare and politics, which tended to be more accepting than that of their sedentary neighbors. The harsh reality of living on the steppe required that all members be able to provide food through hunting, or if the men were out to war, then the women must be able to herd or defend against opportunistic neighbors. This was a source of fascination to the Greco-Roman authors, who saw it as an inversion of their traditional gender norms, and a prime example of the barbarism of these tribes, which likely became the inspiration for the legendary one-breasted Amazons. Herodotus claims that the Sarmatian women were required to kill a man before being considered a candidate for marriage, and according to one telling, the founder of the Persian Empire, Cyrus the Great, was killed in battle against the Masigatai queen Tomyris. A fair number of grave sites of female Scythians and Sarmatians have turned up weapons, mostly in the form of arrowheads, but a few have had spears, bows, and swords too, though there is the question of whether these were symbolic or literally part of their kit, but going by statistics and the historical accounts, it is more than likely that at least some proportion were active in warfare. Mounted archers and heavy cavalry would therefore be a tremendous asset on the battlefield, employing tactics and strategies that made it difficult for the armies of the sedentary civilizations to deal with. Herodotus' accounts of the Persian invasion of Scythia under Cyrus and Darius I, along with Plutarch's biography of the Roman commander Crassus and his invasion of Parthia, provides the best examples of a classical nomadic army in action. Very often they use their speed and mobility to just remain out of the reach of the enemy armies, pulling them further into the interior of their territory to stretch the supply lines, all the while harassing them with raids. When engaging in battle, the nomads would charge the enemy lines before feigning a retreat, which could cause the line to fracture as they pursued the horse archers, who would then surprise them with a volley of arrows and additional troops. One notable skill is the so-called Parthian shot, which may or may not actually be a Parthian invention, but it allows the rider to shoot backwards at enemy troops while fully galloping or retreating. These skills and tactics, combined with a general lack of urban settlements to besiege, 
Though, as before, this is not entirely true, convinced some like Herodotus that those like the Scythians were almost impossible to conquer by traditional land armies. The nomads were not invincible though. Groups like the Han Chinese and the Romans, or commanders like Alexander the Great, were able to counteract the mobility of the mounted archers through specialized tactics, field artillery, and by employing or incorporating horse archers into their own armies. The steppe peoples also struggled when it came to besieging fortified cities, generally lacking the engineering knowledge to construct siege equipment. The colonization of the Black Sea brought the Greeks into close contact with the Scythian world, most notably the Crimean Greeks of the Bosporan Kingdom and the Athenians, and they were able to develop somewhat of a mutual understanding through trade and exchange. The Scythians were able to provide captives taken in battle and destined for the slave markets of Greece, salted fish, and most importantly, shipments of grain. In return, the nomads sought out Greek ceramics, craftsmen, and wine, which had a stronger alcohol content than the Kumish that they were able to produce. Settlements like Olbia on the northwestern Black Sea coast were commercial hubs that oversaw the exchange and exports of these goods. Intermarriage between the Greeks and Scythians inevitably occurred, especially in the Black Sea region where contact was most common. The Spartokid dynasty, a Hellenothracian family that took over from the previous Archaeonactids, are thought to have been tied by marriage to the Scythian chieftains and kings that neighbored them. One notable figure of Greco-Scythian origin was the 4th century Athenian orator Demosthenes by way of his Bosporan Scythian mother, Cleobule, though our strongest evidence for this comes from a political rival. Athens has provided a few interesting case studies when it comes to the presence of the nomads within the city. The most famous is the alleged employment of Scythians as a sort of police force, though employ is very loosely used since they were all slaves owned by the general public. There are reports of a 6th century Scythian philosopher named Anacarsis, who visited Athens and earned the friendship of the lawmaker Solon, along with a reputation for dry wit and skilled oration. We can see evidence of cultural exchange by way of the beautiful artwork that has generally been classified as Greco-Scythian, which blends the nomadic animal style and Greek realism. A golden comb recovered from the Soloka Kurgan, dating to around 400 BC, depicts a battle scene between Scythian nobles, clearly equipped with traditional Scythian armor and weapons, but also parts of a Greek panoply, like a linen cuirass and a Corinthian helmet worn in a similar fashion to contemporary busts of Pericles. The relationship between Greek and nomad was not always a peaceful one, nor were the nomads seen in a good light. The Scythians and Bosporan kingdoms waged war upon each other a fair number of times, and the former were actively involved in the dynastic crisis of the latter that took place during the late 4th century. The image of the Scythian and other nomads was ridiculed by the Athenian playwright Aristophanes, who paints the picture of drunks, dimwits, and decidedly un-Greek in the Lysistrata. Scythian heritage was routinely used as a target of mockery, like with Aeschines attacks towards Demosthenes, or an anonymous Athenian towards Anacarsis, who suitably replied, quote, Well, granted that my country is a disgrace to me, you are a disgrace to your country. The later Justin describes the Parthians as warlike and fickle in both policy and attitude, and though he admires their military capabilities, he also has a tendency to affix a cruel despotic streak onto them, and such stereotypes about nomads would be carried for centuries afterwards. With nomadic culture and the Greco-Scythian relations out of the way, let us move to the Hellenistic Age, when the expansion of the Macedonian Empire into Asia brought the Greek world into closer contact with the tribes of Central Asia, which would lead to some explosive results. During his Central Asian campaigns in the year 329, Alexander the Great came into conflict with the Saka along the Jaxartes River, though the historian Arian describes them as Asian Scythians. Despite the superior position of the Saka on the opposite riverbank, Alexander managed to cross the Jaxartes and drove the nomads into flight, thanks to a combination of light-armed troops and ballista, siege equipment that fired large bolts that would pierce through anyone unlucky enough to get in their path. These tactics would be quite familiar to Arian, who successfully led a Roman army in battle against the nomadic Alans during his tenure as governor of Cappadocia in the 2nd century AD. This would be the first major conflict between the nomads and the Greeks, 
at least when it came to Alexander and his political successors. But during the year prior, the Macedonian governor of Thrace named Zopirian had embarked on a campaign into Scythian-held lands, and shortly afterwards was surrounded and killed with almost the entirety of his force. Alexander's father Philip also had dealings with the Scythian king Atheus in the early 330s, before managing to defeat him in battle, and took a Scythian bride, along with thousands of captives and horses. As a potential deterrent to nomadic incursions, Alexander founded the garrison city of Alexandria Eshkate along the Jaxartes, which also acted as the effective northern border between civilization and anything beyond. This ended up incensing the local Sogdians, who had maintained an amicable working relationship with the Saka for many centuries, and the threat of being commercially and politically isolated helped spark a province-wide revolt. At the turn of the 4th century, the steppe tribes remained largely a secondary concern to the Seleucid rulers, who were more preoccupied with the Ptolemaic and Antigonid threats on the western borders of their empire, but they were treated with an overall hostile and defensive attitude by the Greeks. Yet this situation would quickly change, as the affairs of the steppe would transform Hellenistic Central Asia, and ultimately help bring it to an end. Even during Alexander's invasion, the Scythians and Saka were waning in terms of their political importance on the Pontic Caspian and Central Asian steppes, thanks to a combination of gradual settlement and the arrival of new nomadic tribes and nations. The pattern of new tribes moving from along the corridor from east to west and displacing established ones is in large part a consequence of the geography of the steppe. The Mongolian and Central Asian steppes are generally more hostile, possessing drier climates on average than their Pontic Caspian counterpart, thanks to the pattern of airflows from the Atlantic Ocean, which grants moisture to the European grasslands. A relatively consistent pattern of mild weather conditions, followed by briefer dry periods, does give the opportunity for people to cope. But any sort of variation, such as an extended dry season or multiple harsh winters, will put immense strain on their sensitive lifestyles. This can drastically affect the carrying capacity of these regions, and so, when you have heavy population growth followed by climatic or political instability, then this can create a domino effect that will send tribes westward. This has been true since around 1000 BC, where the arrival of the Cimmerians was soon followed by the arrival of the Scythians, and now the same was being done to them. Additionally, the luxury goods produced by the sedentary civilizations also attracted tribes who wished to either take part in the commercial or economic activity of the region, or use it as an opportunity for raiding and plundering. The 4th to the 2nd century saw the gradual decline and disappearance of the Scythians in historical and archaeological records, at least in the way we typically think of them. Evidence suggests that many of the semi-nomadic or purely nomadic tribes were now settling permanently along the Black Sea, especially in the regions with the closest proximity to the Crimean or Bosporan Greeks. There is an increased concentration of fortified settlements as far as the Don and Volga rivers, which coincides with the increased demands for grain by the cities of the Mediterranean. Scythian material culture, namely the animal-style art and designs, also disappears with the advent of a number of new tribes to the Pontic region. The most relevant group to the Western Scythians were the Sarmatians, or Sauromatai in Greek, a large confederation of various tribes that had moved westward. Our earliest mention of the Sarmatians comes from Herodotus, who describes them specifically as a non-Scythian peoples dwelling just beyond the Crimea and Don River in the 5th century, though they seem to share a similar Iranian language. It's unclear as to whether these original Sauromatai are the direct ancestors of the Sarmatians, but some form bearing their name had begun to encroach upon Scythian territory during the 4th century. The Sarmatians are thought to have been poor and possessed a less materially complex culture, based upon Kurgan excavations, and Herodotus reaffirms the more wild nature of the tribes by positing that the origins of the Sarmatian peoples was due to the union of Scythian men and the Amazons. Initially, the two parties seemed to be on reasonably good terms, but Diodorus Siculus informs us that hostilities developed between them, and claims that by some point, perhaps by or before the second century, the Sarmatians destroyed or conquered much of the Scythian peoples. Eventually, the region just north of the Caucasus Mountains would bear the name Sarmatia, split between the tribes that were part of this confederacy, the Roxolani, Iazyges, the Syracis, and the Aorsi. 
The arrival of the Sarmatians and assimilation of the Scythians on the Pontic Caspian steppe was certainly an important development, but the ramifications of this event would really only be felt during the time of the Roman Empire. A more immediate and dramatic impact upon the Hellenistic world would take place in Central Asia instead, as new tribes moved westward into the steppe and into the interior of the Iranian plateau. The first major group was an Iranian-speaking tribe known as the Parni, or Aparna, who had begun to settle on the edges of Margiana, approximately eastern Turkmenistan, in the early 3rd century. For those that aren't familiar with the name of this tribe, they are more well known by their later title, Parthian, earned from their invasion of the province of Parthia, which can be confusing since some of the ancient writers conflated the history of the later nomadic rulers of Parthia with that of the original inhabitants. Originally, Margiana and the surrounding regions were home to another group of nomads known as the Dahai Confederacy, and it is thought that the Parni were either members of this confederacy or were just on the periphery of their territory. Alexander's conquest of the Persian Empire resulted in the Dahai soon collapsing, and the confederacy broke apart into independent tribes, with the Parni taking advantage of the political turbulence and setting out on their own. The instability of the Hellenistic world and the wealth of urbanized Margiana compelled them to make raids across the border into the Seleucid Empire, the first of many clashes between the two, and they became so bold as to invade the province in the late 280s, before a Seleucid general named Demodamus counterattacked and drove them off. The Parni remained quiet in the sources for the next 30 to 40 years following their defeat by Demodamus, but in roughly 247, they gained a talented and energetic king in the form of Arsakis I, who would successfully lead an invasion and occupation of Parthia in modern northeastern Iran. It is there that he will lay the seeds of an empire that would stretch from eastern Mesopotamia to the Hindu Kush, which blended nomadic, Greek, and Iranian traditions, and would ultimately be a major contributing factor to the downfall of Seleucid power. This invasion will be a key part of one of our upcoming episodes in the Seleucid Empire, so I will discuss it and the rest of Parthian history in more detail from there. The last major group, or perhaps groups would be better, to invade Central Asia during the Hellenistic period would be due in part to events occurring between the nomads of the Mongolian steppe and the Chinese emperors of the Qin and Han dynasties. In classical China, two main nomadic confederations existed. The more powerful of the two were the Zhongnu, and the latter was a group known as the Yuechi. The Yuechi were an older confederation that resided in the Gansu Corridor, located within the northwestern Chinese province of the same name, and were the descendants of Tokarian speakers, an extinct language branch of Indo-European origin that migrated into the Tarim Basin at some point in the Bronze Age. The Zhongnu emerged as a major power in the Ordos region of Inner Mongolia in the late 3rd century, when a chieftain named Modu Chanyu, Supreme Lord Modu, took control and forged an empire that covered most of the Mongolian steppe to the edge of the Tian Shen Mountains. Normally the Chinese were able to expand into the steppe, but now the situation had been reversed thanks to the difficult transition between the Qin and Han dynasties, and the emperors were pressured into recognizing Modu Chanyu as a near equal, forcing them to gift him bolts of silk and Chinese princesses. On the other end, the Yuechi were used to being the dominant power of the steppe, but the Zhongnu were pressing on their borders, and in 166 BC, the chieftain of the Yuechi was killed, sending the tribe westwards into Transoxiana. From there, they were once again sent packing west by Zhongnu forces, and by around 130, they crossed the Oxus River and entered Bactria. We know this series of events thanks to the memoirs of a Chinese diplomat named Zhang Chan, who was sent to find the Yue Qi around the same time in order to create a military alliance with the Han Emperor against the Zhongnu. What had occurred was the domino effect in action, something that would be replicated with the later Huns and the movement of tribes west into the Roman Empire. The successive waves of Saka and Yue Qi put immense pressure on the already unstable Greco-Bactrians, and it would be the Yue Qi who ultimately helped deliver the killing blow that led to the fall of Bactria. The Indo-Greek kingdoms would soon face the brunt of nomad attacks too, before disappearing by the 1st century AD, for the Saka and Yue Qi would eventually make their way into India. Under King Maues, the Saka would establish an Indo-Scythian kingdom in the late 2nd century BC. One of the tribes that made up the Yue Qi would eventually build their own empire that encompassed northeastern India and Afghanistan, becoming known as the Kushans, who would rule from the 1st to the 3rd centuries AD. 
I hope that through my discussion, I have been able to demonstrate the relevance of the steppe nomads in the course of human history, whether it was the impact on language, on animal husbandry and warfare, through the introduction of horses and horse riding, or through trade and cultural exchange. Looking back though, what were some of the biggest changes for the societies of the steppe with regards to the Hellenistic period? The Scythians, while not completely gone, were but a fraction of their former presence, instead replaced by the arrival of several new tribes from the eastern steppes. However, the most likely and obvious change to occur during the Hellenistic Age is the creation of several new empires backed by nomadic power. The Parthians, the Kushans, the Xiongnu, and the Indo-Scythians. But we're primarily focusing on the first two in the relation to our show. Before this, there was no sense of political unification on the scale as the Arsakid dynasty, as the Scythians were still divided up into several disparate groups, and these new nomadic political bodies now rule over a largely sedentary population. The displacement of the Uechi and Saka would help bring about the downfall of the Greek rulers of Bactria and India, though it wasn't always a matter of conquest, a topic that will be discussed when we get there in the podcast. Many of these nomads would prove to be rather effective rulers, preferring a more hands-off approach that allowed much of the previous administration to continue functioning long after the last kings were deposed. As I stated earlier, the Parthians would blend nomadic, Greek, and native Iranian imagery and traditions, while the Kushans would adopt Greek coinage and script. In conjunction with the contemporary Han Chinese and Roman empires, the relatively stable Kushan and Parthian empires would help create a corridor of trade networks and allow for the movement of ideas and peoples across Eurasia on an unprecedented scale, leading some to describe the period between the 1st century BC and the 3rd century AD as the First Silk Roads Era. Despite this, the attitude of most of the sedentary civilizations remained hostile, and not without reason. The invasions of Central Asia during the Hellenistic period caused serious political and social turmoil, and were but a taste to come with the eventual expansion of the Hunnic Empire, which sent tribes into the Iranian Plateau and Europe during late antiquity. This generally hostile attitude towards the nomads is something that would be continued to be practiced by the political successors of Alexander the Great, namely the Seleucids, who controlled Central Asia from the late 4th to the early 2nd century. Alexandria Eshkete, likely having been destroyed, was refounded under Antiochus I as Antioch and Scythia, reinforcing the idea that the division between sedentary and nomadic communities would be enforced. The threat of allowing the nomads to gain any sort of power was actually a bargaining chip which helped ensure the independence of the Bactrian king Euthydemus I, who argued to the Seleucid king Antiochus III that they were really on the same side in their upholding of civilization against the barbarous steppe peoples, namely the Parthians. The Romans too would find themselves at odds with the Parthians, Sarmatians, and later migrating tribes like the Alans, Huns, and Avars. Interestingly, Alexander the Great became a symbol against the nomads in the medieval traditions of the Alexander Romance, credited with building an enormous stone barrier against the steppe peoples of the Caspian region, who have sometimes been identified as the hostile tribes of Gog and Magog from the Bible and Quran. One 12th century Persian poet, Nizami Ganjavi, penned this verse just shortly before the arrival of the Mongols. Quote, who thus established a barrier on the mountain? Sikandar, who affected the prosperousness of Ajam. The Iskandrian wall of shelter is from where to where, from the circle of Chin in the east to the boundary of the west. With that, I can say we are finished with our discussion on the peoples of the steppe. If you are looking for further resources on steppe nomads or wanted clarification on the materials we've covered, check out my episode transcript, which is available in the podcast description and in the episode notes on my website. I hope you enjoyed my rather broad look at a very dense topic, and we will be covering those like the Parthians, the Uechi, and even the Xiongnu in more detail in the future, since they play such an integral role within the stories of both the Seleucid Empire and Hellenistic Central Asia as a whole. If you like this episode, consider leaving a review on the platform of your choice, or you can support the show by donating to my Ko-Fi page, or by picking up a show-themed bookmark from my Etsy shop. You can also find and follow me on a number of social media sites like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and all of these links will be provided in the podcast description. Our next episode is entitled Mapping the Oikumene, Explorers and Exploration of the Hellenistic World. So, until then, 
You've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast.